How many fake accounts do you think Facebook took down in 2019? <laughs> I don't know, 500 million? Right, but it's 6 billion. <laughs> it, there's all this conversation happening. What we should do until we rationalize our information ecology, we're never going to really see sustained change. We can't mm. solve racial equity. We can't solve climate change. It won't be cohesive. It won't be coherent. We're basically living in a digital world where everything is silo. Facebook, for example, Example. Exactly. They make a lot of value. Yeah, who's capturing all of it? <laughs> right. It's not us. There's so many problems at the scale of civilization that we need to be able to deal with them on a collective basis. It's designed so that people can use bridges to stitch together a web of information, the entire relevant information ecology. Some of those voices are most deaf, Talib Kweli, Talib did this amazing rap from the perspective of a butterfly. Who's rapping from the perspective of an insect? Right? Real quick, I have a confession to make. Talib Kweli got me locked up. I'm a little mad at him, but I'm grateful for his music. Welcome everyone to episode number nine of Noetic Nomads and to the Age of Aquarius. I'm filming this right after December 21st, 2020, AKA the winter solstice, AKA the great conjunction, AKA one of the craziest days I've experienced in a long time, but that's a whole nother story. But on this crazy day, let me introduce you to our next guest, David Benjamin. This man is the definition of a sense maker and change maker. He's done everything from being a coordinator at the local Clean Energy Alliance to being a presenter at the Green Life in San Quentin to helping bring to life Pacha's Pajamas, an augmented reality children's storybook on climate change. Now he's leveling us up to Web 3.0 with the Overweb, a trust layer over the current web which allows the internet to work more like a human brain so we can create a shared context and engage in some real collective sense making. Speaking of the collective and taking things to the next level, I have a special announcement. On January 21st, 2021, the Overweb team will be hosting the Overweb Challenge, an online virtual hackathon where you get to decide what the next evolution of the web will look like, and by doing so, also be eligible to win some shiny prizes. There'll also be a panel on the state of the internet with speakers such as Fred Brown of the Forbes Fund, Nicole Chi of PlatformAbuse.org, Andrew Hacker, very appropriate name, of Thought AI, and surprise, surprise, Albert Kim of Noetic Nomads as moderator. What? Go to theoverweb.com slash challenge. That's theoverweb.com slash challenge for more information and to register for the event. And I'll also provide a link in the show notes on how you can sign up to be one of the pilot participants of the first bridging competitions. Bridging being the world's first knowledge esport and one in which the best sense maker wins. And wink, wink, there may also be some prizes in store for you as well. Man, this has got to be one of the best Noetic Nomads intro so far, right? But let's get to the episode already where David and I go over everything from building digital nations with the overweb to getting paid for bridging through cryptocurrency to David's collaboration with Mos Def and Talib Kweli and how Talib got me locked up when I was a teenager. You watch Noetic Nomads on YouTube and listen on podcasts? And be sure to sign up for our newly launched Noetic Nomads Discord server, where you can connect and collaborate with some of the most brilliant minds in the Metasphere, including many of the heavy hitters who just migrated over from the Stoa Discord. Link is in the description. All right, here he is, the CEO and vision keeper of Bridget.io and the father of the overweb himself, Davi Benjamin. It's now. Welcome everyone to another brand new episode of Noetic Nomads. I'm Albert Kim, that boy your mama warned you about. And with me today is a father, storyteller, shift shaper, and social entrepreneur who's about to revolutionize what you thought the web was by helping create one which is human-centered, one that, rather than dividing, helps build bridges that connect ideas and people with a new technology called the overweb, the next level of the internet. One of its initial projects, Bridget, has already won acclaim, being recipient of the 2019 Culture Award from the European Commission's Next Generation Internet Program. 
but more than just bridging together info on the web, our guest is tackling the current education crisis with his project name school, has won international acclaim for his empowering augmented reality children's storybook inspiring climate action, Pacha's Pajamas, and has continued to live out a life of upliftment of underserved communities ranging from Oakland to San Quentin. Nomads, please help me in introducing a vision keeper of a more beautiful world in which all people, regardless of race, gender, age, wealth, or any other marker, have the same fundamental right to take part in a community of knowledge sharing and creation and of peace and love. He is the one and only David Benjamin. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, thank you so much for coming on today, David. Oh, wow. Albert, thank you. Thank you for that intro. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure. I mean, I, I didn't even come close to going through all of it. I would have been here all day again. Thanks. I know, look, all those projects are listed. I know you're a very busy man. So I really, really appreciate um, you coming on. And so like, I would like to start by, I don't know if you remember the exact manner in which we met. From your recollection, how did we come across each other first? How I ended up coming into interaction with you was through North Bateson's mm. PNP, People yes. Need People. people need so people. It's, a, it's a set of Zoom dialogues where they get people together to explore the trans contextual nature of our lives and our being. So mm. uh, essentially you get into a session with a set of people and explore conversation and then they switch you to an entire different context a few minutes later and mm -hmm. you start the conversations again and then uh, you, it, after a little while they switch you again and then through that time you've explored this particular um this particular topic through these different contexts so it's a really mm -hmm. interesting way of of just seeing all the connections and how how the everything is interdependent mm. and I, i'm really curious how you found out about uh nora's people need people sessions because i got it through like a back door like i had known about nora bateson's work uh you know with you know a little bit from warm data and such but uh mostly because of her sessions at the stoa uh and some other uh like like sense making channels that i saw her on but I actually, someone like just like randomly mentioned it in like the Discord, so the stuff with Discord, and that's like, oh, it's invite only. It's like, okay, I'll check it out. It's the only one I attended, and somehow I came across you. So I was wondering like how you found uh, her people need people sessions and what attracted you to them. I had been attracted to Nora's work through seeing some YouTube videos about maybe. 12 months ago and and I contacted her to have a, a short conversation and mm. I was at that time planning on doing an article about uh, sense making and was planning oh, on really? talking to a number of different sense making people and she ended up um, not just through that conversation but through a couple subsequent emails enrolling me to go to her warm data training um post training mm -hmm. sessions in pittsburgh in february this year so oh, wow. i i flew out to pittsburgh um pretty much last minute um one of my collaborators pj ross of umi uh, we had been meaning to connect we we had met at the black blockchain summit in howard at howard university in September 2019, he heard me talking. We we're both panelists, but he heard me talking. And he said, we're going to work together. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I didn't know what it was. And I really didn't have a good sense of his project. But over that period of time, we had been trying to get together. Anyway, Nora told me she had this event in Pittsburgh like eight days before it was happening. She said, you should mm. come. And I'm sitting here saying, mm, I don't have it in the budget. That's coming up really <laughs> quick. But let me let me call PJ. He should go, right? Mm. So I told PJ about it, and he said, uh, "Well, let me look into it." So he looked into it a little bit, and he called me back. Okay, he said, "Yeah, I'll go, but you're going too." He mm. said, "I'm going to get you a ticket yeah. uh, for the workshop. I'm going to get you a plane ticket. You need to come. You need to meet me. We need to both be at this session." Mm. So we went to that session, and since then, I've been plugged into Nora's work and. Uh, this is probably the, the third PNP that I've participated in. I was very pleased to have met you, Albert. Mm, yeah. 
Yeah, chance encounters and like synchronicity. And like you mentioned that like you found her through the sense making space. And I could tell like uh, while I was doing my research that uh, it seems you are plugged in. And uh, I don't know how long you've been plugged in, but obviously, uh, you know, like uh, you mentioned uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger's work and all that. So I was wondering how you got drawn into the whole uh, sense making space. Well, it's funny because I think for the most part, I was working on on my own. And I think it probably started around six or seven years ago. It became very concrete to me that we needed to figure out ways where we can have conversations at scale, collective Mm. conversations that bring in everybody's intelligence and allows us to collectively come to the right decisions or the right choices. And through that, that exploration, I started getting um, more of an appreciation for some of the things that Daniel Schmachtenberger and Mm, Jordan Hall and some of these other folks, uh, Jamie Wheel. And I think I first was exposed to Jamie Wheel Wheel at a Silicon Valley blockchain society meeting. He was giving Mm. a talk there talking about stealing fire. And just the way that he spoke about our situation, game B, rivalrous civilizations, uh, self-terminating, sense-making. Uh, the, these terms were, some of them were different for me and, and I hadn't really thought about things exactly that way, but they were really aligned and provided some clarity and uh, another way of, of describing some of these things that, that I was talking about. And then it became clear to me that, oh, well, when I'm when I'm talking about people coming together and being able to have a conversation, we're talking about a collective sense making and mm. collective co- communication. Some of these things that um, I may not have even really had words for before. So they they drew me in. Jamie Jamie um, drew me in, and somehow looking at his work led me to Schmachtenberger and to Hall. And all of a sudden, I'm now seeing Nora Bateson. And and it just became kind of an interest of mine to see how that worked aligned with what I'm doing. Mm, yeah, I could definitely see that entryway into the whole sense making space because it's a, when I when when I look at all your different projects or like Overweb and Bridget, like that's exactly what you're trying to do. Like, you know, you know, one of your many goals is trying to you know get rid of fake news. How do we come to consensus? How do we connect all these different people? So I'm not surprised that you got into this space. And here's the thing with me, I only got into it like a little after COVID hit. Like I had actually heard of Daniel Schmachtenberger years ago. Because like he with his uh, neurohacker uh, collective company, and I'm into like, uh, you know, supplements and biohacking, I was super into health like that. And that's how I discovered that was my gateway into the Schmachtenberger world. And uh, collective insights, people, if you have not listened to the collective insights podcast, the early ones where Daniel hosted, those are some of the most mind blowing podcasts you could ever listen to. So that's how I got into it. And, and I'm, I would love to get into more into Schmachtenberger and his Consilience project. And I find like some real parallels between your work and what he's doing. Uh, but first I would actually like to go back and rewind. And like, I want to know like, where did you grow up and how that impacted like the choices you made in your life and your career? I grew up in, in Berkeley, California. I was born in San Francisco, never lived there, raised in Berkeley, I'm living in Oakland now. And hmm. Yeah, Berkeley was a magical international place where it was definitely a liberal bastion in many ways at that time as well. And it opened me up in a way that I probably wouldn't have been able to be opened if it was in New Jersey Mm. or or Saskatchewan or even Oakland. I mean, mm, Oakland yeah. and Berkeley were really different in that respect. Berkeley was just like this melting pot of ideas, more mm. so than a lot of other places. And I'm, I'm sure that they probably skewed liberal, at least at, at that time. And um, being in a place where you would meet people of all ethnicities, of all ages, and be able to, to have conversations and interactions with them was really powerful for me and it just stretched me and allowed me to get to the point where I I feel pretty comfortable going into almost any situation because that's what it was like when I was growing up. 
Yeah. So in a lot of ways, you grew up in like a ground zero of like a liberal America. So yeah, I'm sure that like definitely influenced your path. And I could see with like that, that's that string that runs through. Um, so like what I'd like to go into right now is woo, the what you talked about, what we talked about in that original PNP session. And you're like mentioning it like, oh, it's called the overweb. I was like, the overweb was that. And uh, like it's described as uh, the trust layer over the current web and it allows you to build bridges between ideas. And one of the real sexy things is it, trying to increase our capacity for collective sense making and allows the internet to work more like the human brain, you know, rather than however it's working right now. So I was, could you please briefly go over what the overweb is for a community? Yeah. So the overweb, as you said, it's a trust layer on top of the web page, on top of the web. And the notion here is, is very similar to that idea that that Einstein uh, supposedly had, but is misquoted on probably all the time, yeah. where and- <laughs> this notion of, well, you can't solve a problem from the level of consciousness yes. that created it. And I actually believe that's true. I don't think that Einstein actually said that, but mm. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he probably said some things that yeah. were pretty similar to it, and someone kind of like paraphrased mm. it. And all of a sudden, we have a meme that makes a lot of sense. And so I, that whole notion, I think, is absolutely true for the internet. Mm. I mean, we have all these different problems. I mean, I could probably fill up. 10, 10 pairs of hands with the problems, but I mean, <laughs> privacy, security, uh, yeah. uh, exploitation of our data, uh, false claims, false news. I mean, it can go on and on. Mm. Uh, I don't think if we continue using the internet as it is the web with one layer that's controlled by the person who creates it, I don't think that we can actually solve this. I don't mm. think we can solve any of those problems um, mm. the way that we need to so that so that they don't disrupt our democracy, they don't disrupt our sovereignty. So I'm suggesting creating a meta layer on top of the web. Uh, a layer, as I said, it, you said as well, it could be considered a trust layer. It also could be considered an annotation layer. Mm. So annotation is like writing in the margins of a book, that's annotation. That was always thought to be something that would be on the web as well. The annotation is parcel to the definition of the web. So what is the overweb? It's basically a uh, trust layer on top of the web that enables annotations, and it has some patterns. There's three main patterns. So one, safe digital space. And that is knowing that anyone that you interact with on the overweb is a person in good standing with the system. Mm. So that's number one. And we, we know that uh, that's not how the web works right now. No, I mean, no. Let, let me ask you this, Albert. How many fake accounts do you think that Facebook took down in 2019? <laughs> David, I cheated because I listened to the interview where you gave this answer, but like, okay, but I, if, if I didn't know the answer, right? You said 3 billion Facebook accounts, right? Yep. And then the number of fake accounts that they had to review, that they remove, I would have said like, I don't know, 500 million. Right, right, right. But it's 6 billion. <laughs> 6 billion. That, that's mind blowing to me because yeah. that's twice as many fake accounts as real accounts. And mm. not only did they say that, they also said that at any given time with Facebook, 5% of all the accounts on the system are fake. Mm. So yeah. what does that tell you? What does that tell you when there's so many fake accounts? That's, that's not actually something I wanted to ask you about, right? All these fake accounts, right? And like, I, I saw in one of your interviews, right? That it's just like, you know, like people were Zoom bombing you and it just like that's, and it just like, and of course, like people trolled all the time and they put fake accounts, they put fake ratings and all this stuff. And another, but another thing that I was actually uh, interested about so how exactly would uh, the overweb tackle this? Oh, well, that's it. With the safe digital space, the, our onboarding process is not designed to get as many people on the system the 
absolute quickest possible manner with the least amount of information given. Mm, We're going to have an onboarding process that gets sufficient information so we can know that there's actually a real person on the other end. And the, the, one of the ways that we're going to do that is by checking for the, the phone number to make sure that it's a real phone that's being used and that it's unique in the system. And we see that at least as the first step and that will get us down to all accounts would have a real phone number associated with them mm. that's unique and has unique information associated with it. I think you get you get past the majority of the problem if you handle it that way. And I think in the future, we can get to biometrics. So, so yeah. Ah, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So safe digital space. We know that everybody on the system is a real person in good standing with the system. And at the same time, we build in provisions for people to have multiple per- personas. And ah, yeah, I see. so you, it still will be possible to, to, actually make an anonymous um, post or comment or an, some kind of annotation, but you will know that that anonymous person is actually tied to a real person. Ah. And if it turned out that that anonymous post is inappropriate for the particular domain that they're a part of, we also have the concept of a digital nation. Um, mm, yeah, yeah. But um, if, if that, that particular post is incongruent with how the digital nation that they're a part of wants to wants to operate its code of conduct, then they can be deactivated. And if they're deactivated, there's no throwaway accounts. You end up basically having to go through some type of reactivation process or rehabilitation process before you can get back on. It is like the social security card. I can go out and I can charge a bunch of stuff but if i don't pay it then i have to live with it and it's the same way on the overweb if you know what the, what you put out in the world you have to live with you can't go ahead and cyber bully and then mm. the next week start another 10 facebook accounts that yeah. just won't happen on the overweb yeah wow i really love that because we're bringing back the tribal dynamics but the, but the good tribal the in the the, the intra tribal dynamics which, you know, our ancestors and still many societies around the world still, you know, uh, uh, partake in. It's like, there are real social consequences. You know, if you troll everyone, you know what? They're going to kick you out of the group. If you, you know, if you, you know, it's just like, you can't get away with an antisocial behavior anymore. And I love that because I was actually, that's something that I actually wanted to ask you about because like I've been into uh, Balaji Srinivasan's work a lot lately. And he, one of the, one of his uh, uh, points that he likes to bring up is the, the utility of pseudonymity. Where, like, where like sometimes you don't want to have your, you know, your, your identity for like everything you post, but at the same time, it, like, there are consequences like that, you know, that, that go with not having your name attached to it, but like you're bringing it in and integrating it. And what, what's even more beautiful is that you actually have a, a, a rehabilitation feature, just like in this physical world. It's like, okay, I messed up. I'm sorry. I didn't know. And it's like, okay, we'll let you back in, but you got to promise to be a good boy or girl, whatnot. So I love how all this is, uh, imitates uh, real life. So that, that's really amazing. Yeah. And, and going on that process, um, that idea around the ability to rehabilitate, maybe when you rehabilitate, you don't initially get all the functionality Mm, or maybe within your record, your public record, there's something there that says, Oh yeah, this person was deactivated during a certain period of time, just so that there's openness and transparency and basically the ability for people to make choices about who they interact with. And we have this notion of a smart filter. You could set up your smart filter so that if there's anyone who's been blocked by more than 10 or 15 people, then you're just not going to even see what they do. Mm. And, and with the smart filters, I think you're going to have a smart filter that's tunable, it's transparent, it's portable. So I should be able to change that level. How many blocks does it take for me not to see the person? I might want to Mm. ratchet that down. And I should also be able to see, okay, if I am doing that, what am I missing? You know, it needs to be transparent Mm, so that I can say, oh, well, this is what the filter let through. But right now I'm not getting what I want. 
let me see what it didn't let through. Ah, I see. And yeah. then I might be able to adjust it to make it exactly how I want it. Mm, like rather than like, I guess what we have right now, where like the algorithm of like Facebook or Twitter or whatnot, Facebook, they decide, oh, you want like you got you could change some of the settings and you could like mute someone or, or but like for the most part, like they don't give you that option of fine tuning. So I mean, yeah, that's really cool. Um, but you know, one thing yeah. that, that you mentioned, uh, <laughs> I, which is, I'm really excited about because as I stated, um, I, I'm into Balaji Srinivasan's work a lot lately, uh, for people who are unaware, he was like the CTO of, uh, Coinbase, uh, founder of earn.com and all these uh, amazing things. Basically he's like in the crypto and tech space. And he started, I don't know, David, if you're aware of his, uh, 1729 project, uh, I, he was, uh, attended, a, a, an inter intellect salon where he talked about his network state project, where he's basically building a city in the cloud, uh, where he takes, he has a VR university, you know, I mean, that's going to be built by all these like collaborators. And then they're going to bootstrap a digital economy out of it. And then crowdsource land from the participants of that community in order to start this network state. And it's, it's, it's called 1729. It's after like the Ramunajan, uh, one of his numbers, the, the Indian mathematician. So I was just wondering like, how exactly uh, would we wow. build? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot to take in, me, right? Sure. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I just wanted your thoughts on that. And like, how could we use uh, the overweb to build a digital nation? I think that communities like that could come onto the overweb and they can define how they want to work. They can then basically have their own layer on top of the internet that they can communicate, mm. interact, meet each other within. And they will have the choice as well to make their information available to other communities, other layers as well. That's an interesting piece around the land. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about that? Oh, sure. Um... So again, so again, it's going to start in 1729 is for people 1729.com. And it's basically his pilot, which just started like uh, last week, is that he's going to get like the early adopters, the visionaries, right? Who are into it. And then he's going to selectively allow them to like uh, attend the lectures and like kind of like, like learn about his network state book that he's releasing chapter by chapter. And then uh, from there, they're going to build like a virtual university using VR and like they're going to like code it and they're going to like put information, time, energy into it. And then via that, they're going to, I don't know exactly how, but they're going to bootstrap a digital economy, create their own currency where, you know, they could facilitate exchanges between each other, bring other people in. And then eventually they're going to start crowdsourcing land. That's going to be done, I'm assuming, with what I know. It's because first it's going to be like literally like the individual community members, like their apartments, their houses, and be like, hey, pitch in. Like this is like part of the community right now, right? But then over time, it's also going to be like, hey, now we have all these funds. We have like this communal pool of funds. So now let's like start shifting it out to like, hey, let's buy some land over here. Oh, how about we buy this tract of land over here? It's very much like a decentralized state that's all in the cloud. The end goal is to be recognized by the United Nations. Now, it sounds crazy, but the way that Balaji uh, presents it is there are so many countries around the world with like less than uh, a million people. Right. And like all these, and they're recognized. I believe 60% of countries in the world have less than 10 million people. So if we could get a critical mass of like 1 million plus over time, it's quite possible that we have the leverage to actually be like, hey, we're independent. We want to have our sovereignty. And it's going to be a new type of polity because you're not locked by geography. Like I'm not very familiar with Estonia's like e citizen model, but it's kind of like that sort of thing. So I just think it's very, very interesting. Yeah, that is really interesting. It, it reminds me of uh, The Good Country, which was an effort. I only know one of the people that was involved, Madeline Hang, but The Good Country was bringing together people who were aligned with sustainability, wanted to make a better world, and mm. they were creating a state that was a digital state, not defined by boundaries, but defined by alignment, by alignment with this notion that we need to make the world a better place. I think that they were able to get more than a thousand people becoming members where they were paying $5 oh. a month, something on that order. And I'm not exactly sure why they ended the experiment, but 
pretty interesting parallel to what you're talking about. With the 1729 project, it seems as though it goes many steps further where they're they're wanting to create a digital economy among these people and mm. as well this notion of uh, basically bringing the online to the offline right i mean they want to be able to be working with real land so when mm. you say crowdsourcing land is it just that someone says that i'm going to make my home part of this nation or are they giving up some sovereignty with the land is how does how does that work yeah, I mean, so far, I've only read the intro because that's all they've released so far. I attended the salon where he talked uh, in length about it. My grasp of it, at first it's going to be like, you know, this is my apartment, this is my house. It's not necessarily saying, hey, you could crash anytime you want, but it's kind of like soft, like, hey, this is kind of part of the thing. But eventually it's going to be like, hey, we're actually going to pool resources in order to buy land like that. We want this track the land over here. We want that. We want that office building, right? It's still so foreign to me, but like it's so foreign to like everyone. But like, yeah, it's just it's very interesting to think about. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to what we were talking about before, I, I said that one of the main patterns of the overweb is safe digital space. So there's actually three. The other two are on-page presence and on-page interactions. Mm. Okay, so on-page presence is this capability to be able to meet people on web pages right now when you and i both go to the same web page we had no idea unless we talked to each other that we both went to the same web page maybe if that web page has comments and i happen to look all the way down to the last one i might see that you were there right mm, but yeah. you know that is if you made a comment <laughs> <laughs> but we're envisioning something different because we believe that going to a web page is actually an expression of interest in a particular subject, which means that there's a possibility for alignment with the other people who are coming to that web page. So we've come up with this notion of becoming visible on a web page. So there's a toggle. I can go from not being visible to being visible on a specific web page. And if I do that if i become visible then i'm able to see everyone else who's visible on that web page mm. i can look at their profile whatever they're making available for people they don't know to see so i can look at their profile i can also go ahead and initiate a communication request to them and you know would you like to have a chat would you like to have a video conversation mm. so yeah. it's a way of meeting people on web pages which we can't do right now yeah that is so brilliant because so many of these features you keep talking about these benefits and it's just like and i'm good. trying to build my uh online community at noetic nomads now of course like I, if you go to the site i mean it, it looks nice but it's pretty much look i'm gonna tell you the truth it's pretty much all wordpress plugins it's nothing like it's no over web or anything like that i listen to what people want like you know i see a twitter comment here a post here and like these features i like, talk about like hey like I just want to maybe have a video chat with someone. I want to contact someone on this, that, and that. And like this facilitates so many of these core wants and needs that I, that I hear. And I think that's amazing. And I know uh, one of the, your, uh, I guess, pilot projects with Overweb is school. And as I mentioned, like this is big, 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 big ongoing problem with how do we educate our kids? And now that everyone's stuck at home and then they have all this mess going on out in the world this can really help with that. So I was really wondering if you could help explain what the what school does and how it could help with what's going on. Yeah, well, school is creating a safe and engaging digital space over the web page. It is creating a online school platform for K through 12, higher ed, eventually workforce and lifelong learning will be in there as well. And it will create a, eventually a marketplace of learning experiences that the learner can get support from a personal AI to help them understand mm. the best trajectory through the different learning experiences. And with school, we're envisioning that this universe of learning experiences, it could be as large as you know a course or a degree or a certification or credential, but we can also have 
micro credentials. We can have even say a lesson where it's a self-directed lesson where you watch a movie and you answer questions and write an essay. That could be a learning experience. And depending on the subject of the film, that could be for many, many different types of learning experiences. So we're, we're looking at just this possibility of creating a very vast universe of learning experiences that anyone can avail themselves of. And anyone can create a learning experience. Anybody can take one. If I create one, I can set the price for it. Yeah, I mean, this is so, so elegant because it hits so many points. And again, with, with uh, school, it's uh, primarily targeting K through 12. But now I, I know you're also with the Overweb project overall, like, uh, like many of your initial use cases, it's kind of like research organizations, like people really doing like hard research, trying to connect ideas, like forming a map. Uh, of ideas via Bridget and like it again this scaling thing and you're trying to incentivize like all these different things like for example you're trying to create uh, the first what is it uh, knowledge sports with bridging you're having bridging contests and uh, this is super exciting because as I said I'm really uh, trying to build my own community and like with all this talk and that I've been listening to lately maybe my own digital nation who knows and one of the things is I want to bootstrap my own digital economy. Like I want people to have skin in the game. It's not just like, hey, I just want to partake in the community. It's like, no, I like I want to bring real value and like try to facilitate people exchanging value with others. So when when I read about that, you could not only organize and share that your research you're doing with Bridget, but you could also monetize it. You know, I just, whew, you know, my ears perked up. So I just wonder if you could speak on how that worked, the monetizability and like how you're trying to incentivize like all these pro-social activities with all the overweb projects. Yeah, absolutely. And that goes back to the third pillar or third pattern. Uh, so it, that's on-page interactions. Mm. On-page interactions, we're going to give you a set of smart tags that you can use anywhere on the web. So there's a note, there's a, a bridge, which I'll talk to you about in a minute, a conversation, a poll tag, list tag, um, a claim tag. The bridge tag is really, that's the piece that pulls it all together, right? Bridget, that's what bridges yes. do. They yeah. connect things and, mm. and they're doing that for the overweb. The The bridging is, is anchoring the overweb actually. So with the bridge tag, uh, basically you're connecting a piece of content on one page with a piece of content on another page with a relationship. Mm -hmm. And there could be, for example, a contradictory bridge from a article, from a paragraph in a news article to a segment of a YouTube video where the person in the YouTube video is saying something that's contradictory to what's written in mm -hmm. the news article. Yeah. So that would be a contradicting bridge between a piece of text and a piece of video or a segment of video. And what we're doing with respect to monetization, and a lot of it is going to be focused on this bridging aspect, and it goes on to that bridging challenge that you mentioned earlier. We want to give people the value that their bridges create in the mm -hmm. ecosystem. And how do bridges create value? Well, the main way is by helping people, giving people more context, helping see how things are connected. And we're imagining that having all this context, having all these connections will help people do a better job at sense making, help them discern what's real, what's not. And if they encounter a bridge that's helpful, then they can upvote it. So that's mm, one thing we're, we're going to be tracking is how many upvotes there are in a bridge. And then the second thing is bridge crossings. Let's so say they're looking at content A, a paragraph on the article that's been bridged, and they move their cursor on the page towards that piece of content. That content is going to signal, and it's, it's going to highlight, it's going to light up, it's going to show a little badge with a number in it. That number is the number of smart tags that have been attached to that particular piece of content. Mm. And if I click on that number, then I'm going to get an overview of all that and, and I'll be able to see the matching smart tags. I can then decide, oh, well, okay, I want to see the video ones that are contradictory, that are bridges, and it'll show me the subset of those. And then if I want to, I can click through 
on one of those bridges and it will take me to the segment of that video that we spoke about. And that's a crossing. When you're on one piece of content, you're on content A, and you cross over to content B, that's a crossing. So we're gonna, mm. we're gonna look at upvotes and crossing and then use that to determine the value that we can then give to the user. So if they create a bridge that a lot of people are using is about Biden or Trump or the election or whatever, and there's a lot of people using it here or now or, or later in the future, they'll get rewarded by the fact that they've created something that other people are using. Um. That is so awesome. Like the multimodal, it goes from text to even a YouTube video, who knows, like a SoundCloud clip or something. That's amazing. It's like, it's very uh, trans contextual. Uh, like we mentioned at the start with uh, Nora Bateson's uh, People Need People session. So I love how that dovetails and like that the monetizable thing. Cause like, again, like uh, do my research. You're like, no, I don't even have to do my research. You know that this advertising model, not so great, right? And like uh, you gave these uh, uh, <laughs> figures and talked about how Google search and AdWords, they take in over $100 billion annually, but they only index was it 0.03% of the web. And then on top of that, 95% of web traffic goes to sites on page one of Google search results. So we're not getting anywhere. It's like you have to, it's like, unless you optimize SEO is like, we're not getting this map quote unquote of reality. Our sense making is being hijacked by whatever, you know, whoever is basically the algorithm and then whoever could hack the algorithm the, the best. So it's kind of like, I, I believe that um, someone um, kind of referred to the overweb almost as like a decentralized Wikipedia. Like how would you best describe it? Well, I'd say there are some aspects of it that are like a decentralized Wikipedia and that it allows anybody to contribute whether Wikipedia still does that or not, that's a whole nother <laughs> that, matter. There's a that's lot a, of problems. We could go doing that, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I think that, you know, that's that's a pretty interesting way of thinking about it. Another way that I've thought about it is it's like a GPS for online information. Ah, um, GPS, I don't know. Uh, another way it's like minecraft for knowledge because we're building knowledge oh, yeah that's, really right? that's what a great school one yeah. is doing so with school we're basically providing the students with the capacity to create knowledge artifacts which layer on top of the page which makes their thinking visible mm. that's valuable to them yeah. because it reduces cognitive load because they can they basically have now a perfect memory that's easily retrievable. There's no problem retrieving that information. So it's good for them. Their peers can look at what they've created and can interact with them and create things around it. So it creates the possibility of collaboration right there. And the teacher can look at the knowledge artifacts that I've created and use that as a way to understand how well I understand the material, as well as maybe get me back on track, give them a sense of you know how my thinking is limited and how they can help expand that. Mm, yeah. I mean, one of your taglines was you want to make uh, uh, th uh, you know, thinking visual and like, and like this, this is actually one of the things that I've really uh, been thinking about lately, like doing my Noetic Nomads project. And like, I try to plan and it's all just linear words line by line. I'm like, this is not how I think, you know, like when I, you know, it's like, it's like, okay, okay. I'll give you a little inside baseball. Like right now, like as I'm going uh, through all these conversations, like I have, you know, like this one note of, of notes, right. But it's just like, I got to scroll down to look at it, scroll back up, scroll back down. But it's like, there's like, there's a, you know, it's like one topic here and then, but there's one topic here, but they should be linking. But if I had a visual web, <laughs> I'm just like, oh, this, 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 this. So it just makes so much sense. And um, actually what I wanted to go back to is actually, okay, this is the thing that I'm really interested in. Well, one of many things is that you mentioned, of course, uh, the monetizability, uh, but uh, how exactly would the whole monetizability thing work? Uh, and I, uh, the, the context within which I asked that is that I believe that you stated that Bridget is implemented on Holochain. And uh, for those uh, unfamiliar with Holochain, is basically um, a distributed ledger technology like blockchain, but different uh, in that every node has its own ledger. So it's one of the most scalable distributed ledger technologies because you don't have to put in, you don't have to like, uh, I guess, verify the chain every time. You could just have maybe even like a one-to-one. -one. So I was just wondering, how do you see all these different concepts such as the overweb, blockchain, Holochain, uh, interacting and would that have anything to do with the uh, payment mechanism? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we haven't implemented on Holochain yet, but we yeah. have okay. intentions to do. I, I, I think see. it's a super interesting technology and it and it, it's actually so well aligned with us that mm. if we can make it work, I'll be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah, so with Holochain or some kind of blockchain, the some of the benefits we get are basically knowing exactly who we're we're dealing with, um, you know, strong authentication, authorization. But the the other piece is the ability to give small pieces of value out. You can't really run a business where you're essentially getting people to pay for things in credit cards that cost less than a dollar because exactly. there's a 30 percent yeah. fee right off the top mm -hmm. right um and it's the same way with something like a bridge i mean a popular bridge we're going to be able to just give you a little bit for every incremental usage of it but we want to give you that little bit and and if it's popular then it's going to add up and it's going to actually make a difference for you but we're still working on just little increments of value that we're, we're able to give them. And, and that can be done very well with a hollow chain currency, can be done with blockchain tokens. These are perfect for it. I mean, you right now, if you want, you could buy a 10 thousandths or, you know, or a hundred thousandths of, the, of a Bitcoin. You can make an investment of however large you want it to be. And it's that scalability going from the absolute minute to large is what was really exciting about working with either tokens or some other type of electronic currency like we could do on Holochain. Mm, yeah, I'm definitely uh, very bullish on uh, blockchain, Holochain, all these uh, distributed ledger technologies. And yeah, I mean, definitely. And of, of course, like, you know, it's been a while since people regularly bought Bitcoin in whole, like right now it's at 17,000. So yeah, so I mean, like right now people are like, eh, give me like a, like what, 0.1 or something like that. So yeah, Um. so I like to do a little detour because this is something I found really interesting, especially because uh, I have a two-year-old niece and there's another one coming on the way. And uh, I don't know if you have anything in the works similar because I would love to know about it, is uh, Pacha's Pajamas. And uh, it's, it, it's described as like she's a Shiro who teaches children how to turn passion into climate action. And then when I saw like the people involved in the project, you talk about Mostef, uh, Talib Kweli, uh, Cheech Marin, uh, Le Nubians, Lyrics Born. I was like, man, these are like this. Is a lot of this is my childhood. So I just am really interested in how this project came together and like what it was like uh, doing something like this. It's interesting. Pots's pajamas, I've been working on for about a decade now. Um, mm. Lately, I've been more focused on on Bridget and the Overweb school, etc. But it's it's definitely something that just recently actually has come back to the fore. But really, the, the thing to, to really say about it is, have you heard that idea that it takes 10 years for an overnight sensation? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, We're at 10 years now. I for see. For Pacha's pajamas. And mm. uh, yeah, it's, it's um, like my second daughter. Malia is my first daughter. And mm. then my second daughter is is Pacha. And my third uh, one is Bridget. So I see. I see. <laughs> and um, yeah, I've worked with an amazing group of, of core people on that project. Ala L. Henson, mm. Dre Johnson, and my co-founder, Aaron Abelman. We took... It took a long time. It took a long time to come up with a story world that was coherent and that would draw just about anyone in. We got to a book in 2016. It was called A Story Written by Nature. And it was an, it, it's an augmented reality book. There's an app called Pacha Live. You put it over the book and the illustrations in the book jump off the pages. Mm. and start talking, dancing, singing. Some of those voices are most Dev, Talib Kweli, Cheech Marin. Talib Kweli does a rap from the perspective of a butterfly. <laughs> most Dev awesome. is the, the narrator. Um, and, and, you know, it was beautiful working with those guys. I mean, they're geniuses. Uh, Talib, <laughs> he went to the butterfly Wikipedia page, told us to just have the track rolling just continuing and just like sit back just stand wow. by <laughs> so wow. we just hung out for an hour or so 
and you, an hour later he said, Oh, I'm ready. I'm about to drop these. And, and <laughs> he just went ahead and, and did this amazing rap from the perspective of a butterfly. You've never heard Talib Kweli do anything like that. <laughs> or most, most, uh, most rappers, adult rappers. Yeah. Who's rapping from the perspective of an insect, right? Yeah. But this was science. He he took the information, the number of legs, the number of eyes, how they see, what they see, you, you know, their progression from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Put all that science into mm. this really cool rap song called Butterfly Life. <laughs> wow. Like, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall when he was going through that. Like, that would have been amazing. And it's just like, okay, I mean, like, real quick, uh, I have I have a confession to make. Okay, so I got into a lot of trouble when I was a kid. People who listened to some of my uh, previous episodes would know that. And uh, actually, Talib Kweli, he got me locked up because back in uh, 2001, when I was a, a young tyke, uh, I didn't have money to buy CDs. So to buy Reflection Eternal, you know, circa 2000, I uh, tried to shoplift it. And uh, I didn't quite get away with it. So I, I went to juvie because of Talib Kweli. So I'm, I'm a little mad at him, but I'm, I'm grateful for his music and for being part of Pachas Pajamas. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, man. Wow. Well, you know, we learn from these things, right? That's, yeah. that's the one thing that I've learned more than anything else, that everything is a learning experience. Mm, yeah, exa exactly. I feel like, I mean, this, everything, like, I've been through so many uh, struggles in my life. And I know like with your work in, uh, uh, with, in San Quentin, you know, just like these are learning experiences. And sometimes, you know, like the way the system works, you know, uh, we got to deal with it. But it's like, as long as we're here, we got to make the best of the situation. And like, I've, that's the thing that I've learned through all my terrible troubles. I was actually locked up for three years when I was a teenager. So, but I got out of that and then now I'm doing this and then I'm trying to be like, Hey, you don't, you don't have to stay, you know, in that realm, you know, like I was, you know, like, again, I, I told my story, but again, I was, I was locked up for three years. I was in group homes. I was in institutions. I had a terrible life. I was working minimum wage jobs. And then now I'm like, I'm just flying because, you know, like I just believed in myself and I just kept going. And uh, that's why I really appreciate your work. When I said that you were working with people in San Quentin, it's like there were people coming in to visit people like me when I was a juvenile, juvenile delinquent. So, I mean, that was uh, really awesome. And I, I really appreciate your work in doing that. Um, you know, one thing I want to mention, just because you said how to make the best of it. So I have a practice when something really bad happens and it could be the end of a marriage. You know, I've done, I've had that happen. Mm. Um, but it also could be the end of a business. I've had that happen as well. Mm. Or it could be even something like COVID. But the, the practice is to ask myself, how could this be the best thing ever? Mm. Yeah. What I've found is, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of self-talk initially. Like, oh, yeah. it can't be. This is actually horrible. I mean, yeah. this is like the worst thing ever. Why are you asking me? How could this be the best thing ever? But what I have found is that question has opened so many different doorways mm -hmm. for me to be able to actually look back on some things that I thought were just the absolute worst thing and say, you know what? these were essential to my, to my, exactly. my progression. Exactly. They were the best thing that could happen at that moment, mm. even though it felt like the worst thing. Yeah. I, I embody that 150%. Like I, like I'm, I'm to the point where I don't even ask the question, why did this happen to me? It's always like, why is this happening for me? Cause like, I was so, so I was like, I was in such a hole. So like, but then I realized looking back, like, for example, I had the worst, I was in the worst health ever, right? Like I, I got, like I just, I had my body, it got to the point where I was, I could barely lift my arms like above my shoulder, above shoulder level. Like I was just, I was so weak. Like I would just walk like a few steps down the, like I walked down the block and I would just start sweating like profusely. Like I was just in terrible health, uh, you know, terrible shape and just terrible health. Because of that, I got into, I got obsessed with nutrition. I got obsessed with exercise. I got obsessed with breathing exercises, with meditation, with yoga, with spiritual development, with relational development. If I had just been, if I had been normal, I would have been probably a, a average, a little above average. But because that happened for me, now I'm like, 
I could tell anyone want to ask me about health? Anyone want to ask me about biohacking secrets? I could tell you that. I could tell you how to get go from zero to 100. So I'm 100% with the, the, the zero to 100 mentality and what's happening for us rather than to us. Oh, I love that. I love that. What is, what's hap- why is this happening for me? I love mm. that. That's amazing. It kind of fits into the other way I, I like to frame it is a no regrets lifestyle. Like mm, yeah. just not having any regrets for anything. Recognizing there were things that I, you know, I didn't want to have happened, but you know, should I have a regret about something that led to my marriage breaking up? Mm. No, because my marriage was meant to break up. Right? Mm. I mean, yeah. it, exactly. it goes back to that health thing as well. Um, yeah, I had an ailment for a couple of years. Yeah, it was one of those things that's pretty embarrassing. Mm. And that experience that brought me to yoga, that brought yeah. me to meditation. Exactly. That brought me to basically every door, spiritual door that's open, I believe has a genesis in that, in that period. Very similar to your story. Mm. Yeah, I'm, exactly. And just like, I think like, I think we just, we need to change our relationship with these ideas. Cause like, like, like the word trauma, right? Everyone has some sort of trauma, emotional, physical, spiritual, but like th- just because you're quote unquote traumatized, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that you drop into like this permanently worse state. Cause it's not just you're traumatized into uh, like, a, like when people PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, but on the flip side, it's also quite possible. And in fact, you hear these inspirational stories without that trauma, right? Without the trauma, they would have never become who they became. Like that post-traumatic growth is another way that you could look at it. And it's just like, how do we support people from not falling into the disorder from the trauma, but from the growth from the trauma? So yeah, I'm, I'm totally with that. And I know that's what you've been doing with your projects, hopefully that's what I'm doing with my projects. So again, like it's amazing. And uh, okay, I just want to add one quick thing for selfish reasons. What is going on with Podges Mamas where it became a 10 uh, year success? Because I want to actually get one of those, whatever it is for my niece. <laughs> well, Pachas Pajamas is available on Amazon right now. Uh, ah. Pachas Pajamas, a story written by nature. Uh, we have a website as well that you can check out and get more information at pachaspajamas.com. I'll spell it P-A-C-H-A-S-P-A-J-A-M-A-S.com. Hmm. We're actually in the process of um, making it into an animated series. We're in the early stage of the process. Okay. Yeah, but I don't we, want to jinx it. Yeah, okay. Okay, so Yeah, I mean, we, we have a team in place that it has put together a really strong treatment of what a series could look like for a preschool show. We're also interested in potentially a show for six to nine year olds as well. We can imagine either one of them. We actually see Pacha as a, a character that can grow with the kids. Um, ah, yeah. He, the, the whole notion of Pasha is she's a little girl with big dreams. Her dreams are bigger than Andes Mountains, which are the homeland of her ancestors. Mm. And when she goes to sleep, the plants and animals on her pajamas become her guides on a dream adventure to learn more about herself and her connection to the natural world. So mm. it's all about this dream, the, the, the capacity of dreams to give us information and for us to learn so we can bring back this information to the waking life. And uh, recognizing that it's about dreams, well, dreams are recurring. Mm. I've had, there's some dreams that I've had throughout my life. So we're structuring the Pacha world in that way, such that there's a three-year-old Pacha that has very simplistic dreams. And in this first story, she's just meeting the animals basically, right? Mm. That's all it is. That's what you need for kind of a picture book. There's also a seven-year-old Pacha for the early reader book where she meets the animals, but there's a little conflict and she has to get together with them and they have to create this big festival uh, Mm. in nature, the biggest festival in the history of the planet, except no humans were invited. They Mm. actually think Potch is a little gorilla because she's wearing a gorilla mask Uh. through that book. Um, But there's still another Potch that's 10 years old. And she's the heroine, the sh- the shero of the young reader book, which is available on Amazon. 
it's for you know eight to to twelve year olds. The, that's the age age group for that book. And she's ten year old. It's it's a story that's got a lot of complexity. It's not just meeting animals. It's it's meeting the animals coming together with them to put together this great festival and there's an antagonist mr tick who wants everything to stay the same mm. and he wants to stop their festival so there there's a lot going on in this older one but yeah we really see the value of of having a character that can grow with the learner yeah and uh, i was just enraptured i felt like a little kid like <laughs> like the campfire while his dad is telling him stories like that is amazing and i'm glad because i went to the website the the the, the Podges pajamas website and it said sold out so i was like no but it's actually available on amazon right now yes absolutely okay. awesome and again congratulations <laughs> on whatever's coming up i mean i'm really excited for that um and now i wanted to speak now about like the core values of Overweb. And now uh, from what I read that they were truth uh, with respect to transparency and, uh, and having visible context, uh, freedom of knowledge, so that the ideas are free to be discussed and that you could have fact checking and also equity and inclusion. And so all people, you know, regardless of whatever category you might fall into, they all have the uh, same access to the knowledge. And uh, the reason that I bring this up is because uh, I believe that I really believe in the importance uh, in, of baking in, uh, you know, your values at the start, you know, because the initial conditions are so, so important. And to have, you know, in order to, from the start being like, hey, we want to have a diverse set of underrepresented voices. It's important because if you don't make it explicit at the start, you could uh, get away with it. You know, so that's the thing, like with no nomads from the start. Uh, my thing was like, I wanted to have people who are not, you know, the, you know, traditional experts, you know, I mean, not the traditional, you know, for example, in the game a world, it's always like, Hey, you know, we're going to have like this group of people, right. They're the experts, you know, you, you pay attention to them. It's one to many relation. Right. But you know, it's, it's just like, that's not happening. You know, that's not working so well if you can't tell by <laughs> this COVID world. Right. And then, um, and then, so again, this collective sense-making thing is like, okay, these experts don't know everything. So, you know, how about the people on the ground? Maybe they have a clue what's going on, right? So that's why I like, I'm not, I don't want the traditional experts. I don't want the people who, who everyone has known for, for the, this whole time telling me what to think. I want to know from everyone, the collective, the real smart people on the ground. And then, so with, but the thing is in the game B world, I still saw some of that same dynamic happening. And I don't want to name names. I don't want to, you know, uh, name specific categories, but they, they look similar, right? To the game A figures, the game B figures who are kind of sitting at the top and telling people how it might be in the future rather than how it is right now. Game A tells you how it is right now. Game B, they tell you how it is in the future. So uh, where I want to go with this is like what your personal take is in the values that, that, you want to put into projects like the Overweb and Bridget in school and how they're going to, uh, you know, pervade as time goes on. Yeah. I mean, you've mentioned a, a number of them and another one that I, I definitely want to throw in there as well is value. <laughs> like, mm. Create value. Yes. Be yes. creative, express yourself and do it in a way that's creating value I want a system that's going to give me the lion's share of the value that I create. Mm. And that would be such a departure from what we're doing right now with Facebook, for example. Exactly. <laughs> they make a lot of value. Yeah. Who's capturing all of it? Oh, it's, uh, right. it's not us. Exactly. Um, yeah. Transparency, I think, is super important. Uh, being able to to work as a, a, a co on a collective basis, I think that's where we really fall down right now. And as humans have always fallen down, really. I mean, we just don't have the capacity to work with groups larger than you know Dunbar's number, Dunbar, one fifty yeah. maybe. I just haven't seen a good capacity for us to do collective sense making, collective meaning making, collective communication. And these are the things that we need to do to be able to deal with the existential threats that we have. I could look in any direction you know, and, and say, oh, wow, there's some major problems, whether you know, talking about food and topsoil, overfishing the ocean, climate change, resource issues, pulling oil, you know, 
finite amount of our energy resources, whether, I don't know, maybe that's not so much of a problem as a, a feature, but um, <laughs> there's so many things that are happening now. AI is another one. Like, mm. where will AI go in singularity? And th there's so many problems that are really at the scale mm. of civilization that we need to be able to deal with them on a collective basis, on a, on a civilization basis. And if we're not able to have these conversations, we're not able to have even a shared context. That's mm. what the internet right now, the, the splinter net, yeah, um, yes, yes. doesn't have right? We don't have a shared contest because all the information is in silos, mm. meaning that you have, you have situations where people don't want to use outbound links because they want to keep you in on their pages. So mm. that creates an information silo. And then in social media, we're in filter bubbles. <laughs> yeah. So we're only seeing people who have opinions that are very consistent with us or for the majority of the time. And then in search, which you mentioned earlier, we're in search bubbles where they're giving us things that they think is going to be best for us, but we can't tell what they sifted out and aren't showing us. So mm. you take the, the information styles, the filter bubbles, the, the search bubbles, you basically have a fragmentation of the information. That means when you and I are talking about something, we don't have a common basis of understanding of what the context for that subject is. And mm. that's what I want to create. I want to create an ability for us all to have this big shared context. And we can just focus in on the piece that's interesting to us at the moment. But it contains all the connections that anyone thought was related to any of the different pieces of it. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, again, I love the bridge metaphor because, again, like when I when I look at what I'm doing with Noetic Nomads, like I see I see myself as like a bridge. Noetic Nomads as a bridge. Like as I mentioned, I started at the stove. Like I guess my my initial conditions is I started at the Rebel Wisdom community and the Sto community, and right, and then also maybe like the Future Thinkers community, and then also but like the Sense Making community. I went to Nor Bateson's People Need People sessions, where I found you. And then I'm going to the inter intellect sessions and I'm like, as, as time goes on, I'm like, I'm like wading in and out of all these different communities. And then like, it's like, and I'm acting as the bridge, like, Hey, you, Hey, I found this person rebel wisdom. I found this person at there. I found this person. People need people sessions. So I kind of see myself almost as a bridge as well. So like, I, I mean, I love that metaphor so much. And and, and one thing is, I think it is very salient, especially at this point in time, is uh, not just creating bridges between ideas and, and just like people in the abstract, but, you know, within like groups themselves in the real world. Now, one thing I came across in my research was uh, the Black Browser Project, and uh, where you talked about how it was important to have a safe space to discuss issues affecting black people. And then like, I, you know, like I listened to stories, of all these unfortunate sessions that, you know, were not so polite, if I, if I could put it like that. So I just wondering if you could please tell us about the project and why having spaces like these are important and then how possibly in the future we could build bridges within these spaces and then have all them part of the shared context. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So how this, what's the genesis of the Black Browser Project? Well, after George Floyd was killed, there's all this conversation happening about what we should do. And, you know, some people were protesting and some people were thinking about different policies. And I always found myself coming back to the same point. And that is until we rationalize our information ecology, we're never going to really see sustained change on any of these things. We can't mm. solve racial equity. We can't solve climate change. We can't solve ocean acidification. Any of these things until we, we create the, an information ecology that actually supports them being solved. Mm. <laughs> the, and, here's, and here's what I mean. Just let's, let's talk about Black folks. And so I was talking to Black folks. And I was saying, look. Yes, we need to solve racial equity, right? It has to happen. But 
as long as we're basically living in a digital world where everything is siloed, mm, there's not yeah. going to be really the opportunity for us to, to have the conversations and come to the understandings that are needed to be able to elevate a real comprehensive, coherent racial equity. Mm. Yes, we might be able to get some policies here. It won't be cohesive. It won't be coherent. It won't address everything. That only becomes possible when we address our information ecology. And so what mm. I was saying was, here's an example. So I, a good friend of mine, he's, he's college educated. He's an entrepreneur. He's been moving into the venture capital space for the last uh, several years and having some success there as well. He didn't know about Black Wall Street. So Black Wall Street mm. was in the 1910s, in early 1920s in Tulsa. It's like it's the late 1910s. Um, and, and it ended in 1921. Uh, it was a, a disaster in that basically the, the town of Tulsa turned on this neighborhood. But this neighborhood was so amazing. Uh, this Black Wall Street and... It, it was an example where, where Black people came together and created their own economy. And mm. so they had Black barbershops and um, dentists and doctors and um, newspapers and all the different parts of the ecology were working right there in, in Black Wall Street, it, it, part of Tulsa. It was amazing. People were, were thriving. Something happened and the white folks, they thought that someone had raped a woman or had disrespected a white woman and they ended up grabbing him. And then the black town people, they went and tried to, to stop, you know, a lynching basically. And the whole thing erupted. You had mm -hmm. the basically bombs being dropped on the city. And the, there's two things that I think are really important that, pretty much any black person should know and really any American should know. And that is, first of all, black people were able to get together and create something very meaningful. They were able to create a real economy that actually worked and where they were the doctors, they were the dentists, they were the newspaper writers mm. and they did it successfully and it worked. So it's possible. And then the, the second thing is that these things tend to get destroyed and that, that you know, that, it got mm. destroyed in 1921. And unfortunately, the history books call it a race riot. It wasn't a race riot. It was more people of one cohort jumping on another cohort and destroying it because they had more power than them. And my point here is that a guy who I think should have known this didn't know it. Mm. And there's a lot of people, and I... I totally respect this perspective that if we're going to be charting a course into the history as a, as a people, whatever people we're talking about, we need to understand our history. Mm, yeah. And if people aren't understanding incidents like Black Wall Street, which is incredibly important for Black history, if you're a Black person, then how are you going to be able to conceive of the full possibilities of where we could go. So the, the Black Browser Project is designed to create a safe digital space for Black people and allies to come together and talk mm. about issues that affect the Black community. It's uh, designed so that people can use bridges to connect pieces of Black history to current events, to be able to connect firsthand accounts to current events, to basically stitch together a web of information, basically the, the entire relevant information ecology for the black community. And there's a lot of other things it could do. It could help people buy black, like mm. uh, you're in the shopping process and you um, are able to see, the, I'm talking about the online shopping process, at least initially, and you're able to see some of the different options or alternative products that may not be available on Amazon or maybe they are, but um, they're, they're basically products that could be either created by or for Black people or even optimized 
for black skin, if we're talking about mm. creams or some kind yeah. of makeup, those types of things, you could yeah. basically see alternatives that may be more applicable. Those were the three use cases that we've been talking about with respect to the black browser. We've had a number of salons, I think about six salons where we've got feedback from the community on it. Mm. Yeah. And like, I've heard like, I mean, like similar sentiment with like, you know, I've been reading uh, recently about community building and then like, you know, I, for, for, for a while, like I was under like the Silicon Valley mentality. Oh, just scale as fast as possible. Get as many people in as possible. And I was like, <laughs> but then now that I, what actually read, like how you actually build real sustainable communities, like, no, you like you, it actually starts with like a, a core group, a tight knit group, like a strong sense of identity. And like, I read it within the context of like South Asian people. There was like a South Asian, like brown people group, as they called it. And they're like, you know what? It just like, I'm in this group and it, it seems like, oh, safe spaces. Oh, that's like a bad thing. That's like something that like people look down upon. It's like, no, actually uh, having this safe container actually allows uh, actually even greater uh, disagreement within that safe container because they don't have to worry about someone jumping in on them and attacking them. And then they have to, they, they have to de defend themselves. If someone's like, oh, I'm from uh, group X and group Y, I'm afraid group Y is going to come in and start hijacking. Like I have to defend my, my identity. But if I'm within this safe container, I could be like, okay, I don't have to worry about those trolls, those a-holes or whatever. I could just be like, hey, let's, let's figure this thing out. Let's talk it out. And we could actually start disagreeing as individuals of the same group. I understand like that is so integral to, to creating the basis of a, a, a more beautiful, productive community who can then after being uh, empowered within that space can go outside and deal with all these other, you know, all this hot mess that's going <laughs> out there. Yeah. And and, uh, and myself, like the um, uh, the Black Wall Street, the massacre, I was completely unaware of that until the Watchmen series, uh, the HBO Watchmen series. Right. Yeah, and that's the thing. I was just like, when I watched it, I was like, what the heck is this? I was like, this seems kind of unrealistic in terms of like someone's just bombing some sort of like group because they're more successful than them. I was like, oh, this actually happened. Like they were actually that jelly that they just went in like with the state and just blew that whole thing up. I was like, that's incredible. And like, again, like that's really, really important to the history. And like, yeah, I, again, that's why I love what you're doing with all your projects, like, uh, you know, the black browser project and all that. Yeah. And the black browser project, I mean, it, certainly it could work for other groups and we're conceiving of the notion of a digital nation. So mm -hmm. digital nation could be people that are aligned by geography, but it also could be identity. So that's like the black community, but could be the Southeast Asians, or it could be um, people who are from China, but live abroad. Mm. It also could be dog lovers. You could have a nation <laughs> of dog lovers. Yeah. I, mean I was just thinking vegan because I'm a vegan. So like, like when you talk about how like you could like uh, have like these little annotations or whatnot between like the products, you could be like automatically, I don't have to look through all this. It's just like, oh, vegan product, vegan, vegan, not vegan. It's like, it's like some of that. So there's so many different contexts, which is why I love like how elegant your solutions are. Oh yeah. There's so many different permutations. I think that's been the thing that's been a little bit difficult with the project is to be able to actually hone in on some things that whoever I'm speaking to would be really excited about and not bog them down with this whole over web concept or, mm, you know, of yes. course there are some people who are interested in over web and that's why we're, we're talking on places like Noetic Nomads. I mean, yeah. there is an audience for it, but there's also many other audiences that could be really interested in different aspects of what we're doing. And like I said, the hard part has been trying to figure out the languaging and also the use cases that are most pertinent at the particular time I'm having a conversation. Mm. David, that was an amazing conversation. We went over the overweb, Talib Kweli. We're talking about Oh, I mean, creating a digital nation. I mean, this is amazing. I'm so glad that Synchronicity found you and, and bound us together via the bridge and that now you're at my bridge, which is Noetic Nomad. So again, uh, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I just, 
as because you identify as many things, including a, a father, a vision keeper, you know, a CEO, but also as a storyteller. Uh, so I would like to ask you if someone were to write your life story, when it's all said and done, what is it that you wish that others would take from it? I think it would be great if people were to walk away and say, wow, when bad things happen, beautiful things can come out of those seeds, mm. that the things that are happening to us right now, there's an absolute reason why they need to happen. And they are, as you said, they're happening for us, for our collective consciousness to evolve. We had to have a Trump. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Some people, <laughs> exactly. there yeah, are people yeah. within my circle, they're like, oh my God, he's the worst thing ever. You know, he's destroyed the world. But no, we had to have him. Mm. You know, he's putting us on the trajectory somehow. And I don't know how it is, right? Uh, but mm. somehow that this can lead to where we need to go. And by having him in here stirring things up for the last four years, it's actually pushed us forward in ways that we, a lot of us didn't want to go that direction. And yet at the same time, it's just part of it. That's, I mean, that's just how the world works. So I'm hoping that we all can come together and I can continue to be able to just cultivating an awareness that everything that happens is a seed for what's next and that mm, we can yeah. build mighty trees from these seeds that, you know, maybe we didn't even want. Mm. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. I mean, like, is that old story of like, you know, it's like that, what was it? The old Chinese, like, like, what is it? The Taoist proverb It's like, oh, my ox died. That's a bad thing. We'll see. And it's just like, oh, it's just, <laughs> it's just like, that whole thing. It's like the first, second, third, fourth order consequences. It's just like, we don't know how this is going to turn out. Again, like the fact that I was in terrible shape led me to become super obsessed with my health. And now I'm over here. And I'm trying to make the world a better place, building bridges, and then stumbling upon amazing people like David Benjamin, who's doing amazing things. And I'm glad that I could get the word out there about you and all your projects. So where can people find out more about you and what you're working on? You can find out more at Bridget.io. So there's B-R-I-D-G-I-T.io. Also, theoverweb.com. So it's the overweb.com o-v-e-r-w-e-b.com and then school.com and school.com is a <laughs> it's a it's a little bit hard but um i'll definitely so link that one yeah. S K O with a bar o with a bar l.com mm. you make the o with the bar by clicking the o and then clicking the seven well holding the o and then clicking seven we're going to get our search engine optimization together so it makes it a little bit easier to get to it. But uh, the one thing I want to just leave you with mm. is I'm wanting the word of the decade for 2020 to 2030 mm. to be what? Bridge? <laughs> yes, you got it. Yes, yes, I got it. <laughs> what do you think? I mean, shouldn't it be? We need bridges, right? We need I mean, all kind of bridges, right? That 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 is it. Like that's the metaphor between people, between ideas, between just like everything. The web. I mean, yeah, exactly. Bridge. <laughs> word of the decade. <laughs> okay, you heard it here, folks. The word of the decade officially for the 2020s is bridge and that's the final word i'm sorry okay so that's it thank you so much davi for coming on you are amazing again find them at bridget.io theoverweb.com and school don't worry about spelling it i'll link it so you can just click on it all right okay so that's it for another episode of noetic nomads peace out everybody and step up because the world needs you okay bye all right, all right. thanks and we are done